Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Virtual Memories Show, and on Tumblr at Virtual Memories Podcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit Patreon.com slash VMSPod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and, and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week the Virtual Memories Show. Okay, last week was Thanksgiving. I uh, hope everyone had a good time. Uh, I did. We, My wife made a fantastic, fantastic spread. Uh, my father and his girlfriend came over. Uh, other friends of ours came to, to visit. It was um, it was nice, low-key, but a really good meal and, and nice conversation. Um, I also got a nice response to last week's Thanksgiving show, which I really appreciate because um, – as I mentioned in the intro to that one, I came up with it around 4.30 in the afternoon and got the episode together by Monday morning with about 30 of our past guests telling us what they're thankful for. Um, that was nice. It was a nice turnout. Um, they had some really nice things to say, and, and I've gotten a couple of responses from listeners that were pretty good. So I'm happy with how it turned out. Um, now, in general, uh, I did have a good holiday weekend. Um but because it's me, uh, there's one incredibly irksome thing that transpired, and uh, I'm going to vent about it here because um, no one's listening. Uh, now, I don't want to go into too much detail, but uh, the short version is that a publisher canceled a podcast with one of their authors on me with about 18 hours notice. Um, that was Sunday night for a Monday show and uh, came after I read about 450 pages of this author's work in the last three or four days. Um, I also reached out to a bunch of past guests who work in this guy's field and, and developed some really thoughtful questions. And uh, well, in other words, I did a bunch of work this holiday weekend, and it's for nothing. I, I It's not to say I didn't enjoy the books. I mean, I read two of this guy's books. They're fantastic. I enjoyed the hell out of them. But I am damned if I'm going to tell you guys about it because the publisher – um, Sunday night told me, well, the timing's not going to work out for Monday. Thanks for your interest in the books. So that's the third time in a year that I've lost a previously scheduled podcast with an author from this publisher, not the same author, um, different ones, but, um, so I spent a little while Sunday night writing a very angry email and, um, and I did not send it because I'm an adult, sort of. Uh, I, I scrapped it. I saved it, of course. Uh, not as a draft email that could accidentally get sent, but as a text page, you know, uh, on my desktop, so there's no way of it inadvertently going out. Uh, that said, I did send uh, about a three-line email um, telling them flat out to remove me from their contact list, stop sending me previews of their books, and I will go find authors who I can actually get on the show. Um it's kind of bad because I have some history with this this publisher. They've done good stuff for me in the past, but, you know, there are two things here. One, this is work. I don't half-ass this show, except for right now. Um, this actually, like I said, takes takes time. You know, I read 450 pages, like I said. I also did a lot of other reading into reviews of this guy's work, past interviews. I reached out to, to other guests uh, to, to talk about this topic. And and two, and this is where things get gill turning egotistical and all. I have a full time job with real responsibilities and like large scale real world impact, kinda. And I'm not 
doing this show because I have nothing else going on. I'm not some guy sitting in an apartment working on his, his novel and, and ranting about, you know, uh, the unfairness of the publishing world or something. I've got a job. I do this podcast out of love. So, um, so I'm kind of peeved, but you know, on the bright side, as part of my, my raging catharsis, I walked around my, my library down here last night while Amy was watching the last part of the Gilmore Girls uh, uh, reunion show. And um, I wrote down about 40, 45 authors and other artists who I really want to pursue for episodes of this show, uh, just from going over the shelves of my books, uh, shelves of my library. And... Um, and so that, I hope, will lead to some good stuff for 2017. Now, I, I do keep spreadsheets of all this stuff, and I've got, you know, author lists. But this is, you know, sitting down and or walking around and going over all these shelves and thinking, you know, that's a guy I've got to record with. Or, wow, she would make for a great podcast. I need to go pursue this one. So um, so that's a good thing that's going to come out of this, I hope, unless they all say no. Um the other plus side, and this is a weird one, um, there was actually a convergence of my day job and the podcast over this weekend. See, uh, I run a trade association, and recently I was at a trade show uh, pitching a whole lot of different uh, potential member companies to join. These are all guys I've known for years in my old job, and now I'm, I'm trying to convince them to, to join in the association. So one guy I reached out to last week after the, the trade association meeting, or the, the, the trade meeting, and... Um, he wrote me this weekend, just read about you in the hustle book. Way to go, big shot. I had no idea what he was talking about. I thought the hustle book might be some sort of like pharmaceutical insider journal I don't know about, um, or they're keeping track of who is running around the trade show the most. I was doing a lot of running around. Um, but it turns out the hustle book is actually a business book. Hustle, the power to charge your life with money, meaning, and momentum. It's from Rodale. It came out in September 2016, and it's by Neil Patel, Patrick Vlaskovitz, and Jonathan, or sorry, Jonas Koffler. Now, the middle guy sounded somewhat familiar, and I remembered, again, it started to come back to me that I corresponded with someone a year or two back about having the podcast as a creative balance to my day job. I think he was connected with a literary agent I interviewed way back in 2012. So I, I do remember that there was some sort of book that was going to use me, and, and the thing was whether they could use my full name and the, the podcast, and I was fine with it. Um, but I'd completely forgotten about it until this pharma guy was reading this this um, this business book and, and saw my name show up. Um, he didn't write back with, with you know, a, a screenshot or anything, so I, I looked the book up uh, Sunday. And I could not – also could not find any trace of my conversation with Laskovitz, Patel, or Koffler. Um, I went through all my email accounts, my social media things, Facebook, Twitter messages, LinkedIn. Can't figure out where we corresponded, but I know I – maybe it was just by phone, in which case I forgot it the instant uh, I hung up. But um, anyway – I looked the book up. Uh, I found the excerpt with me in it on Google Books, where, of course, copyright means nothing. Uh, so I took a screenshot and transcribed it. And, um, and here's what it says. Gil Roth works by day in an unglamorous role as president of a pharmaceutical trade association. It's a respectable position, but Gil lives a double life. He is a great lover of books and reading, and he was craving an outlet for that side of himself. No job description existed for the honeypot he desired, so he saw the unseen opportunity and felt a need to create an experience for other people just like him. Oh, sorry, to create an experience for other people just like him. What did he do? He created a podcast that he called The Virtual Memories Show. He reached out to famous authors and artists, interviewed them, published the interviews, and built momentum to keep going. The writers whom he interviews get the attention they deserve, the listeners get insight into their books, and Gill builds a honeypot doing something that moves him, and by keeping his head up and eyes open for refreshing ideas and conversation. The podcast is Gill's honeypot, tapping into that which he loves, writers and the work he enjoys reading. Gill's story teaches us valuable lessons about building honeypots. They require small doses of pain. For Gill, this meant nothing more than an investment of time and existing tools. His biggest risk? Rejection. What resources and tools do you have at your disposal now? Use those, not the tools you need tomorrow. Gill sealed the deal to make it real. Anyone can do this. 
It's the classic, simple-to-understand, hard-to-do type of hustle. So I got that going for me. Uh, I'm not sure. I guess honeypot is one of those those terms uh, of, of use in the book. Um, but anyway, that was kind of awesome in a, in a, a weird way. Um, Anyway, uh, I am now in Hustle, the power to charge your life with money, meaning, and momentum, which kind of brings me to this week's guest. And you knew there was eventually going to be this week's guest. Uh, his name is Mike Cole. I met Mike at a party thrown by a past guest, Nancy Hightower. Uh, my wife talked with Mike more than I did. Um, but when we were on the way home, she said he sounded pretty interesting. He had a, this military background. Uh, seemingly practical approach to writing as a career in stark contrast to most of the writers we know who um, who don't really deal with this stuff realistically. We'll just put it that way. Um, but we connected on Facebook and soon after this mutual pal of mine or of ours, uh, and he comes up in this episode, hit me up and said, I have to record with Mike sometime. Uh, he's known him for years and says he'd be a great guest. So I pitched Mike, read a few of his novels, and, um, and here we are. Now, Mike has published uh, most of two trilogies. He's published five books so far. The second trilogy, Ender, is coming out later. Um, the books are Shadow Ops and their prequel, The Reawakening. Um, they're in the genre of military fantasy, which I didn't know was a genre, but I call it Magic X-Men in the Marines. And um, basically contemporary or near future world uh people begin manifesting magic powers governments try to control things u.s ends up with a secret military force of superpowered beings and there's another plane of existence um i would tell you more than that but if you're not already into the idea based on that description i don't think more explication is really going to grab you um these are fun novels they're they're well written it's not what I'd pick up off the shelf in a bookstore because I'm a goddamn literary snob. But at the same time, I grew up on the classic Claremont and Byrne run of the X-Men. So this series is actually right up my alley. Like I remember reading a sample of book one, Control Point, and um, I could totally visualize the action, the the, the super powered magical people, basically, uh, the whole shebang. And I was hooked. So um you should you should pick it up if if this sort of description appeals to you these books will not let you down mike does a great job of of conveying superpowered warfare um his world building is is top notch he describes fight scenes well but he also really evokes the military milieu that these these characters exist in um and that is a big part of what our conversations about and i read the first two shadow ops books on my kindle but on the drive home from our conversation last week i decided, you know what, I'm going to stop at the Barnes & Noble in Paramus and pick up the third one in a mass market paperback. And it's probably the first new mass market paperback I bought in like 25 years. Uh, I, I can't wait to read it. And I would have done so had I not gotten screwed over by that, that publisher I mentioned earlier. Now, as far as caveats go, uh, there's not much. We recorded in my pal Elaine's apartment near NYU. Uh, you'll hear cop sirens every so often. The other caveat I have is I'm sorry I went on so goddamn long. Um, between the irked thing about the publisher and this hustle book, and the hustle book might actually reverberate throughout this episode. Um, I figure you got a short episode last time. You're going to get a lot of rambling from me this time. Mea culpa. And here's Mike's bio from MikeCole.com. As a security contractor, government civilian, and military officer, Mike Cole's career has run the gamut from counterterrorism to cyber warfare to federal law enforcement. He's done three tours in Iraq and was recalled to serve during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. All that conflict can wear a guy out. Thank goodness for fantasy novels, comic books, late-night games of Dungeons & Dragons, and lots of angst-fueled writing. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Mike Cole. Let's start with that. What do you do? And what have you done historically outside of the writing? Oh, outside your, of the writing. Your, so um, yeah. it's a long and storied tradition. So uh, I, my master's degree is in museum studies, and I originally planned to be a museum exhibit designer. And I did that for about five minutes. Realized that I could make a living. Well, I mean, I could make a living if I wanted to be broke. And I discovered that um, I'm of a certain generation of American men who have been raised to have that breadwinner 
provider mentality drummed into my DNA. Um, not making a judgment call on whether it's good or not. It's just who it's I just, am, yeah. and I'm and I'm not making apologies for it. I need to I need to be I need to have what we say in Arabic. I need to have wasta. I need to be a gentleman of property and standing. So um, this was at the time of the tech boom um, when Clinton called on people to go into tech work. So I actually uh, got my first job. I taught myself HTML out of a book, HTML out of a book, lied on my resume, and got my first job for the Pentagon um, <laughs> in IT based on a lie on my resume. Uh, because and I, there was no one who was going to call you on it. Well, I, I had a friend who uh, – it was sort of a half lie. I had a friend who um, had a, a legal firm, and I asked him if I could say I designed his website. And he said yes. The truth is I could have designed his website. Yeah. Uh, but uh, back then it was easy to design a website. But uh, no, it was a lie. And I got a secret clearance and the whole nine. So I went in. I worked there for years. Um, by the time the dust cleared, um, I was the head of electronic messaging at the Department of Education. And then 9-11 hit. And the world went crazy. And we started letting mercenaries do all kinds of things that we shouldn't. Um, war fighting, spy work. So, uh, by mercenaries, you mean what were euphemistically called contractors? Private military contractors, okay. yeah. But I mean, mercenaries is the truth. Yeah, um, I'm just saying, uh, uh, contractors was a euphemism. For, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that's what we call them, contractors. But yeah. um, I like to call a spade a spade. And, um, you know, they, these are private armies. They're no different than the Hessians that the British employed uh, during the American Revolution. Um, and uh, I was recruited by one uh, to do IT, and they cleared me. Um, and once I had my clearance and I was at CIA, I was like, oh, Oh, all you know, it doesn't matter what you can actually do. What it matters is whether or not you have a clearance. And once I was inside the door, I was like, well, why would I want to do IT when I could be a spy? So I um, took a $27,000 a year pay cut to move from IT into operations. And I went to a private boot camp um, where they taught me all the stuff you learn at a military boot camp and more. Um, and I went to Iraq. And... Uh, I was a targeting officer one tour. I was a custodial debriefer uh, on another tour, which is, I guess, a fancy way of saying interrogator, just like contractors saying a fancy way of saying mercenary. And um, on my third tour, I was running a fusion cell. Um, and which is uh, it's a it's a it's a way of moving intelligence between units so that units units exist in different areas and can't necessarily share information with each other. And you make sure that nobody misses it. Um, and, uh, so I, I don't want to overstate the case. I wasn't, you know, swinging a gun on the street corner of Fallujah. Um, uh, but I certainly, uh, was in it. And after that, um, I actually joined the Coast Guard backwards because I, um, I was on a subway wearing my Operation Iraqi Freedom t-shirt and this guy comes over to me and goes, Hey man, thanks for your service. And I was, my heart was just exploding from that because I didn't do it for the money. I did it because federal hiring is like any kind of government hiring. It takes two years to get hired, and then you're there for life. Um, so if you want to get in the fight fast, you go through a private company. That's why I did it. And uh, he said, well, what unit were you with? And I was like, well, I was a contractor. And he goes, oh. One of them. Right. Yeah. And I just felt so deflated. Mm -hmm. And I felt – and then also when you consider my own family history, like my grandparents were Soviet communists. And um, – When did the family come over? Uh, after the Second World War, this fleeing here. So my my grandparents were Soviet communists that got broken out of, I think, Sachsenhausen by the Soviets. So they went to Russia and became communists because that's who saved their lives. Mm -hmm. And then, but Stalin was just as much of an anti-Semite as Hitler. So they fled that to the United States right when Joseph McCarthy and the Red Scare. Perfect timing. So they just my grandparents never had a chance. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, I very I can't even believe I said this, but unironically, when I got commissioned into the Coast Guard, I put my hand on my father's shoulder when he was there, and I said, "Our line of lambs has at last produced a lion." I can't <laughs> believe I said that unironically, <laughs> but I think what I meant by that incredibly pompous statement was that, you know, we had always been against the government, and we had always been hard done by government, and I felt that by serving in the military, I was somehow walking that back and kind of giving my family a place in the American patrimony. Um, and then I continued on, and so I was in the Coast, uh, Coast Guard Reserve and doing first intelligence and then law enforcement, basically a water cop and search. Well, the Coast Guard 
both stations in the Coast Guard, we do both law enforcement and search and rescue. So I was basically buzzing around Manhattan, pulling people out of the water who were drowning and pulling over boats and yeah. inspecting them and things like that. Okay. And um, with the number of helicopter crashes we had over the past 10 years in the rivers here. <laughs> Never did a helicopter crash. We oh. did a lot of bridge jumpers, unfortunately, oh, but um, it was, it's just awful. But, uh, and, of course, a lot of boating while intoxicated is the big thing. Um, uh, so I did that, and then um, I didn't – I sort of soured on intelligence. I, I was promoted up the chain through intelligence, and I finally reached a point where I was at the Office of Naval Intelligence as a program manager. So I was sort of managing technology and budgets, and I didn't actually get to do the spying, which is what's interesting. Hmm. And I'd also soured on the mission. I mean, intelligence at its root is breaking the laws of other countries and stealing their shit. Um, and I understand that's necessary, but it's not nice and it's not ethical mm -hmm. and, um, it burns you after a while. And I think after my experiences in Iraq, I just soured on it. I didn't want to do it anymore. I wanted someone else to do it. And I promised myself that if I got a book deal, I would quit everything. And I was doing well, man. I was being groomed for my, what we call SES, senior executive service, uh, which is like the equivalent of uh, a one-star general, but in civilian service and in, in uh, the government intelligence community. I owned a very swanky apartment in D.C. You know, I had, I was living high on the hog. I made a very good salary. And I promised myself that if I got a book deal, I would give it all up and I would move to Brooklyn and be a broke writer. And that would be fine. That money wasn't important. And then I got a book deal. And I didn't learn the horrible truth. Well, I didn't think it was going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I, I remember because Peter V. Brett, who, if your listeners don't already know about, uh, that you should absolutely read him. He's an amazing fantasy writer. Uh, I really think he's the second coming of Tolkien. I love his stuff. Uh, full disclosure, he's my best friend. So we're on the phone, and he was like, Mike, you promised that you would quit your job yeah. and move to New York if you got the book deal. And I was like, yeah, but, man, that's a risk. So I did it, and I was two years a full-time writer here in New York. And I, I didn't go into debt. Like I did okay, mm -hmm. but I learned the hard way that um, my mental health. I can't. I can't take it. I can't go on a date and not be able to pay. Mm -hmm. I can't have my mother come visit me and not be able to buy her dinner. I can't accept that. I can't live like that. And um, I'm actually very envious of people who have the freedom mentally to handle that kind of lifestyle. But the anxiety was too great for me. So I begged uh, um, to, uh, you know, I, I, I threw out my resume. I begged and for months, and I got very, very lucky and uh, was picked up by a, a major metropolitan police department that I'm not allowed to tell you what it is, but where I live, you can guess. And uh, I'm currently doing um, cyber threat intelligence for them. So what I'm, I'm part of a defensive unit that's only interested in, so if you rob a bank with a computer, I don't care. So that's someone else handles that. If you steal from the police department or you try to uh, penetrate, correct, yeah. then I'm going to come after you. So, mm. And um, it's if you have to have a job, it's the best one on earth. Um, but I'd be lying if I said that if I could, you know. You'd rather could, be writing full time. You got it. Yeah. But now I know how much money I need to make before I can do that without going insane. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a longer story. Oh, than, no. uh, uh, that's... <laughs> Like I said, fear of a square planet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can edit it down, I guess. No. Um, but you have published six novels in the past six years? Five novels. The sixth one, Siege Line, uh, I just turned in, okay. um, and I just finished the edit. So I should be getting my delivery and acceptance letter from them, basically mm -hmm. saying, we're good, we're publishing. Um, I expect it will come out uh, probably in January of 2018. I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. um, I did hand it in a couple of months late, so uh, it, it may be delayed a couple of months. Why late? For um, God's sake, you should have more discipline than this, Cole. Well, I it's swear. Funny, funny you should mention <laughs> because, um, yes, I should have more discipline. But I also subscribe to the military axiom that done right is always better than done fast. Mm -hmm. And you are far, far, far far better off missing a deadline and delivering a superior work of art than you are making a deadline and delivering an inferior one. I firmly believe that. Craft is king, and you can't... Once you attach your name to shit, there's no taking it back. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't feel like the novel was there, and I needed more time to get it there. And, uh, I, you know, I have... Was that something you had gone through previously? To this extent? Almost. Not quite. Um... You know, it's funny. Uh, you would think that with six novels, it would get easier to write. It gets harder. 
Mm-hmm. It's harder. I'm more distracted. I'm less disciplined, not more. And I'm and I think it's because I understand more fully what it takes to produce a good book. I'm more stressed. This last book, I could have sworn it was the biggest piece of trash I'd ever written. And it wasn't until my beta readers, my editor, my agent came back to me and, and said, nope, this is the best, mm-hmm. that I believed it. Um, yeah, see, I never get to that point. I, I just assume anything I write is absolute trash and don't bother sharing it. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're under contract to share it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess so. Yeah, what... Um, what work habits do, or what writing habits do you have along those lines? Well, it's funny. Um, I used to have much better ones. Right now, my writing is extremely distracted. Um, I mm-hmm. call it Twitter patient. Um, I I'm very involved in social media, and I don't have any statistical evidence to prove that being active on social media has sold books for me. Um, but I will say this: you know, I spend the vast, vast majority of my life in a 300 square foot apartment or a coffee shop where I don't know anybody with headphones on, so I'm not talking to anybody, hunched over my laptop. And social media is sort of the one window on the world I have. It's actually kind of pathetic. I, I uh, you know, it's so, I always crack up when people think that, you know, because I'm a writer or I'm speaking at a convention or conference or something that I'm some kind of, you know, rock star. Like I'm the polar opposite of that. And it's my window on the world. It's my way to connect with people. And it's perfectly justifiable because it's work, isn't it? Like it's connecting with yeah. fans. and right. So it's very, very hard and it's very, very distracted. Right now, I'm, I'm trying to force myself to do one to two hours a night, every night after work, no matter what, um, and putting the phone on the opposite end of the room. And I'm not always able to pull it off. Now, I, I once interviewed uh, Lynn Ullman, this, this wonderful writer in, in Norway, who um, she and her husband – would hide each other's phone. They're both writers. They would hide each other's phones. And eventually they got to the point of, we just need to cut off the router and turn off the internet for the work day. And that, that was their, their solution. It's a really good idea. Yeah. It's yeah. a really good idea. And it also prevents you from the temptation of saying, well, I'm doing research on oh, the yeah. internet. So what you do if you're doing research is you put a parenthesis in your manuscript and you say, Look research this, this later. Yeah. And then you continue with your writing. Yeah. I know. I totally think that's great. And um, then cat videos. Yeah, and that's, cat that's videos, of course. Right. <laughs> Peter, uh, Pete, uh, this best friend of mine, the uh, Peter V. Brett, the, the amazing writer, um, has a, a concept he calls phone jail. So whenever I come over to watch a movie with him and his daughter um, and his uh, girlfriend, he'll, he has a wicker box on his table and it's phone jail. You walk in the door and before any other conversation happens, the phones go in the phone jail, the lid goes on and they don't come out until you leave so that everyone is engaged with each other. Even when they're watching the movie. Um, You understand why we're doing this face to face, right? Oh, because we have to. Yeah. I, I don't people. Oh, why don't you do it by Skype or this? No, because the other person's probably going to be goofing around on the internet the whole time because I would probably be goofing around on the internet the whole time. No, it's so, a fair yeah, point. It's, it's, it's a fair point. You know, There's something, you know, I often, I often, re- I'm a very tech positive guy. Um, yeah, but the distractive. Well, I mean, this is when people say to me, like, you know, well, social media isn't a substitute for real communication. I'm always like, what, whatever. It is real communication. Yeah. But it's another mode. The truth is that. Yeah. There's something to be said for face-to-face to communication. I got to yeah. admit, I, I appreciate this format. This is pretty cool. Yeah. It's a line I use from a, a poem by Frank O'Hara, whom I've never read, but I interviewed O'Hara's biographer. Uh, the only truth is face-to-face. Mm. Is and I know nothing of the rest of the poem, but that came up in in Brad's uh, piece about about O'Hara, and I, I lifted it from there. So as far as mission statements go, I just steal from other people, but at least I get it from face to face conversation. You know? you know what's ironic about that statement is when you work in intelligence and law enforcement long enough, you don't trust anybody face to face. No way, man! You get lied to all the time, all day, every day. Well, that's part of my my um, over two hundred of these. I've started to figure out. I don't necessarily care what people tell me, but I, I sort of pick up on what they reveal. Mm. Not that you should be on guard, but, you know, <laughs> it's just sort of – and you of all people yeah. uh, probably know more about the, yeah, better not say X, Y, and Z. <laughs> I say stupid things all the time. Yeah. But it's, it's the, the little revelations and such that, that come out over the course of, you know, an hour of, of waterboard – I mean conversation. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what brought you into to publishing? What led you into to writing? Oh, Besides I, being a giant nerd. I, I, I think it was being a giant nerd. Well, well, I think mind, it was, we're done. I think it was uh, – well, I mean it was really a combination of two things. I think that um, – on the one hand, I was a, a nerd in the classical mold, D and D, you know, war games, comic books, uh, uh, fantasy novels, all of the things that anyone listening to your podcast grew up with. But at the same time, um, because I did, I did have a guest, by the way, who I hit with the final question of heroes or villains and vigilantes. 
I was enough of a nerd to do the superhero RPGs, right? Not just D and D, but yeah, I he, played villains and vigilantes. I yeah, remember that I was very well. Being, he was a heroes guy because it was you know more realistic. No, I remember something. villains and vigilantes really well. Big I, Jeff D freak. So that, wow, that was, wow, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> oh, that's great. Talk about taking me back. Yeah, um, I. Um, uh, but I grew up, look, I mean, not to throw stones at my parents, but like, um, you know, it wasn't the best growing up environment and I was scared all the time. I think it's really important when you're little to feel like you have a rock under you. Um, and I know this cause I see my brother do such a great job raising my niece and I never had that. So when you're scared, I had two problems. One, I was scared all the time. And two, I didn't have any men modeling how to be men, mm-hmm. um, to me. And so I just kind of had to guess. And so I looked around at four examples of male figures that were not scared of things. And, of course, that's all violence when you're a kid. So, you know, I looked at, you know, Wolverine and Superman and whatever um, and the Lords of the Rings characters. um, And my mom didn't approve of fantasy because that was not legitimate. But history is legitimate. So she saw me... Um, with the cover of the D&D basic book manual, which is um, the Dave Trampier cover. It's a red dragon on a pile of gold. And there's a knight in, like, 15th century, like Helmschmied plate armor, aiming a longbow. Like, guys like that would have used longbows, but whatever, um, at this dragon. And my mom knew what a knight was, and that's legit, because that's history. So she took me to the Met. And that was it. I was off and running. Um, And I never got away from it. But what what happened as a result of that is that I had these twin threads. One is the traditional nerd thread, but one was this constant thread of violence and armed conflict and and traditional um, war making male values. So it's kind of not surprising to me at all. In a way, it's inevitable that I wrote the books I did. Um, is that I found a way to nerdize that world of violence that I've embraced for my youngest years and made my professional life in. Um, I, it's funny, people ask me, like, when you wrote the Shadow Ops books, for those of your listeners who don't know, my books are kind of like Harry Potter joins the Navy SEALs. Um, so I go with, with X-Men Marines. X-Men Marines, sure. I was just describing it to a, a former guest or past guest who was a retired Marine uh, major. And he looked you up and said, oh, this sounds kind of interesting. I said, yeah, I think X-Men joined the Marines. He's like, well, oh, it, perfect. I'm on the nose. <laughs> Pete, Pete Brett's, uh, Peter, Brett, Peter V. Brett's uh, quote was uh, Black Hawk Down meets the X-Men, which I think is the best uh, jacket copy I've ever gotten. <laughs> but um, people say, well, you know, are you surprised that that's what you came up with? And I was like, no, I think it's kind of inevitable that that's what I would come up with. Um, and uh, I think that because my initial relationship with science fiction and fantasy was always through text, it was through um, – I mean role-playing games are text. They really are. They're, and storytelling. Um, I mean, you're talking about villains and vigilantes and D&D and Gamma World and Boot Hill and Top Secret and all of the games that I grew up playing. And even the comic books I read. I mean my, my youth was consumed with imagining. And add to that the fact that my mother always taught me she was wrong. Uh, but she always taught me that Coles are bad at math and science and good, and good <laughs> at English. Yeah. And when you're a kid, you believe what your parents tell you. So it sort of became the only thing that I devoted energy to. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when you're good at something, it feels good to do it. So uh, it sort of became inevitable and became sort of the only thing I, I wanted from my youngest days. I wanted to be a writer since I was six. Mm-hmm. What's astonishing is, unlike me, you weren't paralyzed by anxiety and, and going into a completely different career that uh, kept you away from it. I so. am paralyzed by anxiety. <laughs> yeah, and but I you did. don't let it quite totally paralyze you. Well, no, that's not true at all. It paralyzes <laughs> really? me all the time. And I did go into a different career. Mm-hmm. I, I, I went into very safe careers to make money. Um, you know, look, I started in IT, not because I have any love of IT. Um, and the only reason I think I wound up in, in the spy world is because I found a way to do that and make money. Mm-hmm. Um, was when, there a narrative aspect to the spy world that you look back and realize that was a sublimation of the your narrative impulse? Um, I think that it was – look, I'm absolutely baggage-driven. My entire life, if you track it, is obviously a little boy coping with being scared. Um, every single decision I've made along my whole life is obviously me trying desperately to feel safe. Um, and that guided my going into the military. It guided my obsession and, you know – Look, I am right on the line of being – when you work in law enforcement, any kind of arms 
carrying discipline. There are always these people we call holster kissers. Like, they're like hangers on, people who are obsessed with guns and violence, mm. and, but they never actually, you know, serve. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, these people are like, and they're, and they're irritating. Um, Is it just lack of commitment or they would well, not be but, suitable to serve if they tried? Who knows? Okay. Who knows? Either sure that, they're not serious they or, there's, okay. or they're, they're not serious or they have medical problems that keep them out or yeah. they can't, you know, they have colorful backgrounds or they yeah. don't think they, they, they let anxiety stop them. Who knows? Um, but the truth is that I was kissing that thread in my life, my whole life. Um, and I can't tell you what force, you know, made me go all the way and make it into a real thing. Um, uh, but if you, if you look at my life from like a, I don't know, a psychoanalytical perspective, it's all baggage. It's all demons driving me. But I did a blog post on this. I acknowledge that it's all demons driving me. And I kind of like where they've driven me to. Um, yeah. you know, like I really like my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and going to Iraq was horrible. I mean, it's a horrible experience. And there's a lot of horrible experiences, even stateside, you know, doing intelligence work. Um, but I wouldn't take it back. And um, I'm incredibly grateful for where it's put me. And uh, I don't always think – it's funny. I wrote an essay on PTSD for um, oh, yeah, yeah, an, an anthology that. called Beyond the Wall mm -hmm. that uh, James Lauder edited. And I talked about um, Arya Stark and Theon Greyjoy as examples of um, what we call condition black and condition yellow. Um, and condition black – is a condition where it's based off the Cooper's color system, which is a, a system developed for tactical pistol shooting, but I use it to describe states of vigilance and awareness um, as they relate to PTSD. Condition black is being frozen, and condition yellow is being alert. And condition yellow can be exhausting. It sucks to live in condition yellow all the time, as many PTSD sufferers do. But it also enfranchises you and makes you very, very capable to handle situations as you evolve because you're constantly aware. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I feel like my fear baggage that drove me into this career is kind of like that. Um, yeah, it's exhausting. Uh, but like I said, I, I wouldn't take it back. I really like where it's driven me in a lot of ways. What do your parents think? <laughs> so I come from Jewish, uh, New York, Ashkenaz, Jewish, you know, <laughs> my dad is a, was a professor at City College, you know, and my mom. What do you teach? Uh, history. He still mm -hmm. teaches at the new school. Um, but you know, my dad, on, uh, I can sum it up this way. My dad and my friend, Gene Fader, family friend, good friend with my dad who knew me since I was a little boy. When I was shipping out to Iraq the third time, they, um, they had a boat they had together and they took it down to a port in Annapolis, Maryland, where the Navy trains. And I met him there to say goodbye. And, uh, my dad takes a skiff into the shore so we can have lunch and Gene stays on the boat. And he stands up on the deck of this boat in the middle of the harbor in Annapolis with everybody around and goes... Ego Alley, as we know it. But right. Yeah. At the top of his lungs, he goes, uh, you going to Iraq? And I go, yeah, Gene, I'll see you in a few months. And he goes, you should have been a dentist, you moron. What's a Jew going to Iraq? And I'm like, I love you too, Gene. And he goes, eh, and goes back under, under the deck. So, like, that's... That could sums up my family's okay. reaction, I think. And to the writing? That they understand a little better. Um, I mean, it's an acceptable thing to my parents. I think my Do mom... They have a, a, you should have been a literary writer versus a fantasy writer? No, or I mean, it, just yeah, I mean it, it definitely weirds them out. So yeah. my parents, like, you have to understand that armed service, professional violence is... We're Jews. That's right. It's all you need to say. Right. <laughs> it's outside the scope. That's right, Gil Roth. So you know, like you don't do that. Yeah. Um, it's actually, Although my father was in the Israeli Defense Force, but and it's actually really funny because I'm thinking right now of my friend Azrael uh, Peskovitz, who's a Marine Corps captain and a, and a science fiction and fantasy writer as well. And there's plenty. Of We're example. the outliers. They're the outliers, though, not right. not the norm. So, um, yeah. uh, so I mean, like they don't they sort of don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Um, but writing, they understand. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's fantasy writing, which they sort of don't. So I look. You're not worried about their approval? No, not Although at all. Although that's baggage, you know. Everything <laughs> not at all. Is. Look, uh, I mean, they're both very proud of me. Yeah. Right. You mentioned the new, well, the, the sixth book in this two trilogy mm -hmm. series being um, toughest and you thought worst, but actually best. What have you actually learned? 
about storytelling, <sighs> about the writing? Wow. Um, I think the most important thing that I could say to any writer is, um, it, and it's a double edged sword is faith. Mm -hmm. um, Breach Zone and Siege Line, which are the third books in both trilogies, I thought sucked. And in both cases, the, the critical consensus I'm getting from everybody is that they're both the best. And in retrospect, I know I feel pretty good about Breach Zone. So what I learned from it is don't believe yourself. Um, that writing is an occupation that's fraught with anxiety. Um, there's a reason that writers suffer almost to a, to a person um, from anxiety and depression. I certainly struggle with it myself. Um, and when you are suffering from anxiety, your brain is lying to you actively. And when you're smart, those lies are very, very well supported and very, very rational and very, very hard to dispute. And you have to reach a point. It's almost like uh, getting mortared. Um, so if you're, if you're, it's such an, an exercise in faith. Like you hear the take cover, take cover, take cover alarm. And you have to repeat to yourself because some this death is coming somewhere onto this position that you're in. And, um, you know, you're, it's four o'clock in the morning. You're in bed, you know, or not even four o'clock in the morning, maybe six o'clock in the morning. You're in, you're in your, in your rack and you can either get out of bed and, and run to the, to the bunker. And you're, actually, it's a bad idea because you're more likely to get killed by shrapnel while you're up and running. You're better off just rolling out of bed onto the floor and, like, staying down. And you have this moment where you're, like, you have to say to yourself, small round, big base, probably won't hit me. Mm -hmm. And just that be enough to keep yourself from being unable to grapple with how scary it is. Yeah. Um, and writing's kind of the same way. You, you have to be able to look at dedicating years of your life years of your life, hours and nights and weekends and missing social events and missing family events, pouring yourself into this thing. And there is a 99.99999% possibility that it will come to nothing. And you have to face that mm -hmm. and be okay with it. Um, See, most writers I know are, are filled with self-delusion. So they never, they never take that 99.9. They always think they're the one. Well, that's, that's good. I encourage yeah. that self-delusion yeah. because without it, uh, you're just defeating yourself. Well, without it, you can't, you can't proceed. Yeah. Um, so I think there's something to that blind, silly faith. Um, you know, Stephen Pressfield says, write stupid. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's a great philosophy. Is he the do the work guy? He is. Yeah. Um, and, uh, his, his even better book than that is, uh, The War of Art. Which is a practically a pamphlet. You could read it in an hour. And yeah, it was, Fred Valia turned me on to that. I it, haven't read it yet. But. It's the most valuable self piece of help, self help I've ever read. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the great joys of my writing career of going pro was it finally being able to reach out to him and tell him what it meant to me and have him respond. And mm -hmm. I send him my books as they get published. He takes them in Malibu, so it means a lot to me. Which is a regular question I ask people: Do you nerd out? Around authors? Oh, God. Uh, all the time. N tell me the, the most embarrassing nerd out you've had around an author since you've become a published author. Not, uh, it's some, not, the, it's not somebody you met when you were a fan. Not embarrassing. Yeah. It's, um, it, was, it was the most gratifying. That's yeah. what I, I'll, I'll answer the question way. I wish you'd ask. Um, <laughs> so uh, I don't think a lot of people know. It's no secret that I'm, I'm uh, in love with China Mieville. Mm -hmm. uh, he's one of the most amazing people I've ever. And I felt this way um, years before I ever met him. And what's so fascinating to me is that he is a card-carrying um, Stalinist, like a uh, Marxist. He, he – not, not – excuse me, Trotskyite, to yeah. use the correct terms. Um, he believes in proletariat revolution, and I am a security off, state security officer. So when Mieville's masses rise up, I will be on the other side of that riot shield putting them back down. Mm -hmm. um, and his work is so important to me and so significant to me. And um, for the longest time, I felt so torn by be, being so moved by the work of my polar ideological opposite. You know, I thought, this man hates me. He must hate me. I'm the bad guy in every one of his books. Me, personally, which maybe made the reading experience so much more resonant. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he is friendly with another writer in Brooklyn, and she knew – because I just wrote creepy blog post after creepy blog post about, you know, him. And he turns out he was reading them. 
I didn't know he was, but he was. Oh, they always do that. I wrote something about Robert Caro because I was afraid to start the LBJ biographies for fear that he might die before finishing them. Right. His wife emailed me the next day. Like she apparently just oh, searched that morning. Oh, no, he's in perfect health. He's fine. He still jogs two miles a day. I'm like, oh my God, I wrote something about your husband dying. I feel terrible. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic though. Yeah. You, you admit that a part of you felt pretty good. That, oh yeah. It was yeah. Still, who, Robert Caro and his wife know who I am. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, apparently he was reading them. He never contacted me. Um, but this friend of mine uh, was a writer, uh, said um she just sort of got sick of these blog posts and she's like look he's in town let's all have brunch and she sat there and didn't say a word and for two hours i got to ask him every question i'd ever wanted and tell him everything i wanted to tell him mm -hmm. and uh man it was amazing nice it was absolutely amazing and um so you didn't pull the chris farley paul mccartney why are you so awesome no no and when i got back it was funny when i got back uh one of my friends was like so sleep with him <laughs> and i was like no yes but i hope so maybe next time you know so that was amazing yeah nice. um do you feel more reconciled in terms of somebody's ideology and their art not necessarily being yeah i mean now that i've gotten out insane. of the guard um i'm and um do you feel that you're defined the way you were defining meaville by his politics you know it's funny i look uh, once i've gotten out of the guard um when I, when I was still serving, I had to be very, very quiet about my political leanings. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty far left. And um, I had to do that because I was a serving officer. Yeah. And I had people who worked for me, and I couldn't put them in a position where they would be made to feel like I wouldn't serve them well as an officer. Recently with the Trump election, um, I've been pretty open and inflammatory in how hard that's been for me to accept. Yeah. You're and, the first person I've recorded with since the election. Oh, the man. last one I did was October 31st. And yeah, I don't think I could have done one at least for the first week plus. It's been, it's been hard to accept. It's been hard to accept. And um, I'm quieting down about it now because the truth is that I feel like, A, I'm not going to change anybody's mind. And B, um, I've gotten the focus off my writing and the focus on to who I am in my politics. Mm -hmm. um, and that absolutely costs me readership. It really does. Yeah. Because when you write military theme fiction, most of your readers are conservative. Yeah. And when they find out that they don't really like where you stand on a lot of issues, um, you pay for that. Part of me feels like good that I make a principal stand. You know, virtual signaling is the term that the right uses, people on the right use, to, 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 to um, try to denigrate someone standing up for what they believe in. They yeah. say, oh, you're virtuous. I, I know what that is. Um, it means that I'm, I'm doing it right. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. sticking to the cards of my convictions. So I feel good that I've, I'm taking a principled stand, but I feel bad in the respect that when, the, when that interferes with someone's ability to, to just experience my work for the work. And um, so I'm trying to chill um, and... and you know, I've made my principled stands. I, I've gotten to yeah. get things off my chest and uh, and let that be enough. And now it's back to, you know. Would send, you have served a commander in chief, Trump? I, oh, no, I would have resigned my commission. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I'm very glad that I did before this. Um, I was very, very proud to serve under Obama. Um, but and it's funny because I actually got out um, because we were still committing troops to Syria. You have to remember that I operated against Al Qaeda. Um, look, ISIS is just an, an evolution of Al Qaeda um, mm -hmm. under a different name, and then and we're sending troops to Syria to work with rebels against the Assad, Assad regime, who are Al Qaeda. They're jihadis. They're the same people I fought against in Iraq, yeah. and, and that was who were funneling. Yeah. troops over the border into Iraq, and that's why yeah. I I got out because I was like because I realized I'd reached a point where they, if they were like. Well, if, what, what if they – look, if you're a reservist, you have to be ready. When that trumpet sounds, you go, and it doesn't matter why. Yeah. You go where they tell you, and you, you, know, I, you can't be conflicted about that. And so once we were – and this was under Obama. Once we were getting deeper into Syria, I was like, no, no way. No way I'm going to work with the guys I fought against. No way. You move from military fiction into straight – or military fantasy into straight fantasy? Moving to, well, into dark fantasy. Into um, dark fantasy. So it's funny. Uh, my – We'll get back to ISIS later. But <laughs> My favorite sort of sub, sub, sub genre is this, and I'm using air quotes here, the grim dark movement. And by that I mean Scott Lynch, Joe Abercrombie, Mark Lawrence, George R. R. Martin, to some extent, Peter V. Brett. I, I would argue that Robin Hobbs' Assassin's Trilogy is actually um, 
grimdark. A lot of people disagree with me on that, but I, I think it's absolutely legit. That kind of bleak, really, really um, ugly, uh, but ultimately redemptive fantasy is really what what thrills me. And so I wanted to write that. And that's the trilogy I've sold to Tor.com. The Fracture Girl is the first one that will be out. I actually don't, don't even know when it will be out. I don't have a publishing date yet. And um, the sequel, The Queen of Crows, I'm about 50% of the way through. And it's it's great. And I, I like to challenge myself. So I really feel that this, the soul of writing is character. And I feel like the, the writers I admire the most are people who are able to evoke characters that are nothing like themselves. George R. R. Martin's the best example. Yeah. Um, Tyrion Lannister, Jamie Lannister, Cersei Lannister. These people are nothing like George R. R. Martin, if you know him at all. Um, and yet he makes you believe. Um, so, and you'll see this in my own work. Um, you have Oscar Britton, who's an African American helicopter pilot. You have um, Alan Bookbinder, who's sort of a you know married with kids, aging bureaucrat. I was ecstatic that the second the second book had basically an admin appropriations guy as the lead figure. Because yeah. to me, that's the, especially the more work I do with Congress now, I realize that, you know, those guys actually make everything go around. Like you can have yep. the heroes and everything, but somebody has to do all the funding yep. And, yep. and appropriations. And, yep, yeah, so, yep. You know, and then, um, the center was great. Uh, you'll see in Siege Line, um, uh, James Schweitzer is still the protagonist, but the supporting character kind of steals the show is the sheriff, uh, Native American, uh, or excuse me, Native Canadian, uh, sheriff of this town in the Northwest Territory, this hard-bitten Afghanistan veteran. And writing her was amazing because I, I, I both um, was writing from the point of view of a woman and also from an Athabascan Chippewan, a Dene uh, woman, uh, which is a culture I'm not particularly familiar with. Yeah. So to get that voice right was really, really tough. Um, and I love the fact that I extended myself in that. And then with Elwaz, who is the um, main character in the Empty Throne trilogy, which is the one I'm doing for Tor.com, is a... Um, you know, a 16-year-old girl growing up in a sort of really dark ages culture um, living under an oppressive regime. And getting her voice right uh, was an incredible challenge and one of the reasons that that book took me about two years to get done. Um, and what I, what's also interesting now as I try to expand my range, since we're on the subject of range, I don't have a contract yet, so I don't want to officially announce it, but... I have a deal memo, and we're just negotiating the particulars for my first nonfiction military history book, which um, I hope to be able to announce any day as soon as we nail out the particulars. And what's so fascinating about that is in that, I'm writing in a narrative history voice. I'm being very careful to avoid an academic voice, mm -hmm. but it's very different from a, a fiction voice. I still have to unreal a story because my goal is to write narrative history the way that David McCullough does or the way that... Um, uh, Roger, uh, 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 rather Bernard Cornwell, um, in his Waterloo does, you know, sort of real scholarly history that is true to the, the sources and um, provides real scholarly analysis, but does so in a voice that maintains narrative tension and gives the sort of experience that people have come to expect from fiction. So look, I don't know if I'll be successful. I've only ever sold and published one type of book in my life, which is the military science, uh, fantasy. But I'm very, very gratified to be getting publishers to pay me to write in so many disparate voices. It's so important to me, man, to be able to look in the mirror and say, you are not a one-trick pony. You are a writer with a capital W. You have the craft to do whatever you want. That's really important to me. And, um, and there's so many writers. Like Isaac Asimov did a book on um, a Byzantine history. Did you know that? Well, he did 400 of them, so I figured, you know, he must have covered a lot of topics. Right, and like, <laughs> and I'm looking at that, and like, you look at Jim Butcher. You've like, heard the Trump thing, by the way, right? What? The Mule from the Foundation trilogy. You remember Foundation? Yeah. Remember how everything in history was kind of plotted out and everything made sense and, and you know, things are going to follow this right. arc? And then this weird X factor shows up because he can read other people's minds and screw with them and all that. Trump, oh, the man. mule. That's, That's amazing. Yeah, I think Dave Weigel brought it up on Twitter once. I'm like, oh, my God, for all the, the, the foundation nerds out there, you've mm -hmm. managed to encapsulate what was going on in the Super election. Super cool. Yeah. So. Well, <laughs> but anyway, Byzantine history. Well, I, I just I, – I, I, we look at Jim Butcher. He did the Dresden Files, and the Dresden Files is such a specific type of story. And then he was like, eh, I'll do Codex Alera. Woof, all the yeah. way, other, way on the other end of the map. Brandon Sanderson. You have Elantris, and then you have Mistborn. They're just disparate. Yeah. And um, yeah, what other genres do you want to try out? 
And do you think of writing for comics, given your comics Oh, God, history? funny you should mention. Yeah. Um, I have a script. Yeah. Uh, I've written a comic script, uh, and it's about um, 17th century Cossacks um, uh, on the Polish-Ukraine border. And I actually have an artist, a Polish artist, living in, in, in the Netherlands who's uh, attached to the project, and I'm trying to get um, proof pages together so I can sell it. Uh, I think it's a really good script. I did a long apprenticeship of... Uh, of uh, studying comic writing through being a lifelong comic book fan. And then, of course, um, trying to really pick apart the craft, Scott McCloud's work and a lot of um, Frank Miller's works on how to write comics. And uh, I feel like I've got a good script and I feel like I have the right artist since uh, given the subject matter, but uh, it's a tough world and nothing's yeah. certain. Um, I how, think. How did that writing differ from the straight up prose writing? Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, everyone who wants to write a comic book must read Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. Um, which yeah, he, is, got, he got mad when we're well, not mad. He, we, we joked about when I recorded with him that I actually uh, had read Reinventing Comics also, but never read the third one. Uh, I think, which I think is just making comics or right, something of that. Right. Um, and he was just, as you would know, if you'd read my third, oh, you know, he just he kept throwing that out there. But, oh. you know, he was a great, great conversation to, to have. He's, so, I mean, yeah. he's amazing. And understanding comics, which is itself a comic, as you know, um, really helps lay out the mechanics, the nuts and bolts of how comics work and how to represent things visually and, and the gradient between abstraction and realism and, um, you know, how to represent the passage of time, but also how to communicate between a writer and an artist. Mm -hmm. And um, what I loved about it, it was very liberating in a way because um, it's constantly breaking the fourth wall. Because when you write a comic book script, 90% of what you're doing is directions to an artist. So you can say it's completely expository. The dialogue isn't because you put in dialogue tags, you tell yeah. what sounds you want to be made, but you say, all right – so from this angle, this panel looks like this. Yeah. Make him look like this, facing this way. So it's entirely expository. It's all tell, don't show yeah. to an artist. That, it's the artist's job to show it. And that's incredibly liberating because when you write prose, it's all show, don't tell. And you have all this stuff that like – and you're so frustrated because you're like, look, if I could just turn to the audience and say, <laughs> this is what I want you to see. Um, and when you're writing a comic book, that's exactly what you do. Mm -hmm. So I found the process really, really liberating. It's constrained. Um, but that's where art comes from, the right. constraints. Right, right, right. And, and the awesome thing about writing a comic book on spec without any direction, I'm basically – because who wouldn't want to read a comic book about 17th century Cossacks? <laughs> I mean obviously the market is crying out for that. Um, <laughs> the grand underserved niche. Right, right. Yeah. So uh, um, I get to do whatever I want. Yeah. You know, I know how long a rag comic book should be. I know how panels should break out. But you know, I can write the series as long as I want. You know, as long as I make each issue art correctly – uh, you know, I can take 30 issues to tell my story or 50 issues, whatever. If I'm fortunate enough to have a publisher take it on, we'll negotiate at that point uh, what I'll get to do and what I won't. Um, I assume you have a Marvel or DC property that you would love to oh, well, love to tackle. Yeah, of course. I mean, look. Uh, Dish. Uh, uh, I mean, if I had, if I Everybody could pick got one. got Captain America and Batman and all that. But really, if you had some other weird one. That, that's, oh, weird know, one. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, uh, am I allowed to pick Vertigo ones? Oh, feel free. Uh, or Create, or cr creator image? owned ones are a problem because uh, the creator owns right, it. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, I would love to write, um, for Invincible, Robert Kirkman's yeah. Invincible. Um, I would, uh, um, God, I'd love to write Fables, Bill Willingham's Fables. Mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't mind writing episodes for 100 Bullets, uh, which is an amazing, amazing comic book. You were a Willingham fan when we were D and D geeks. So one of so it's funny. I liked Bill <laughs> Willingham when he did porn. If you remember Ironwood, remember he did porn comics. Ironwood. Oh um, yeah, yeah, with uh, Eros. Porn with comics uh, with real story. Yeah, yeah. So it's funny, and and Bill Willingham would probably hate me because he's a rabid neocon. Like he's the he's 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 the, he's the as right as they come. But one of the great gratifying moments of my life. You know, but Willingham's like worse than Scott Card in the respect that like who cares what his politics That's are. The, he's one of the, the art right, by itself. Right. You know. He is one of the greatest artists ever. I know a lot of people can't separate artists from their art. But the fact is that Bill the Fables is one of the greatest comics ever written in history of comics. And Orson Scott Card's Ender's Games is one of the greatest science fiction novels, the greatest novels, period, yeah. ever written. And I will not yield on those fronts, no matter what they say or do. Um, I'm sorry. You know, you cannot change how monumental. Heck, Marion Zimmer Bradley, 
her. I'm sorry. Yeah. The Mists of Avalon yeah. is one of the great books. And that's one of those in recent years, everybody's got the revisionist you because of the scandals in her life. I understand. That, oh, the work you... itself is terrible. No, no, the, no, work the work is not the terrible. Work meant the work what it meant is to amazing. You when you were, yeah. It means what it means to me now. It's yeah. a great book. Um, but anyway, uh, I saw Bill Willingham at either Phoenix Comic Con. Which or, was my next question. Have you encountered any of these? Yeah. So, yeah. I, so I've met Bill Willingham many times. <laughs> And I met him at Phoenix Comic Con. He's sitting at a table. I'll never forget this. And I went over to him and um, I said, oh, my God, you're Bill Willingham. You know, I'm such a big fan, blah, blah, blah. And I started geeking out a little bit. And he goes, you're Mike Cole. You wrote Control Point. Oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, and Pete was with me. And he looks at me and he's like, <laughs> yeah, it was. So we both kind of geeked out over each other for a minute. And I just uh, that was pretty awesome. What's the, uh, what was your, what was that your big moment of realizing you had an audience? I mean, I know you have, you know, an audience audience, but, but, you know, that moment of, of great gratification. I mean, that was probably up there. Yeah. Uh, that and finding out that China Mieville didn't hate me. <laughs> um, uh, as far as discovering a regular audience though, that you had like normal people who really dug your work. You know what it is? It's, it's the, it's emails. Um, you know, these emails always make you uncomfortable because you don't know what to do with them. Yeah. But you, you get emails from people who say, hey, your work helped me through a hard time. Mm -hmm. Or um, I was able to find the confidence to do X or Y because of something your character taught me. And you never know how to respond because it's so heavy and so big. Um, and you don't know this person. I mean, what if they're crazy or something? Um, but at the same time, that was me, man. Like – yeah. I was so scared my whole life coming up and all of the typical nerd stuff Thought I'd never meet a girl, thought I'd never get a job, thought I'd never be socially a dwat. And it was, you know, Bink from A Spell for Chameleon and Will Almsford from The Sword of Shannara and, um, you know, Batman and uh, um, Frodo Baggins and, you know, all of those characters, um, Taron Wanderer from the Book of Three and the Black Cauldron, that kind of made me feel like I could do things. And, you know, that I had, when I had no friends, they were my friends. Mm -hmm. um, and the thought that something I write could provide that for someone else is pretty sublime yeah. um, when it comes. It, it comes rarely, and I don't think I can ever adequately convey my gratitude to these people when I write them back, and I always do write them back. Um, but... If I do nothing else with my career, I did that. Hmm. Our mutual friend, Neil Canavan. <laughs> I didn't uh, know you know Neil. Yeah, from my, my previous uh, life when I was editing a trade magazine in the pharma sector. Neil's amazing. Yeah, he was a freelance writer for me. And, and once we eventually connected, he's like, you've got to interview Mike sometime. Wow, and, and, uh, he's awesome. He's, a, he, he's an amazing story himself. He worked on an oil derrick. He's... Uh, uh, flogging a book right now about uh, history of, of medicine. And yeah, yeah. He's got a immuno oncology uh, thing that he's in the middle he, of and writing. And he's an amazing that, writer. Yeah. I, I, uh, I I wouldn't be surprised if we uh, if we see that book in stores very soon. Yeah, and we're supposed to sit down once he finally has that out. But he asked, hey, when you sit down with him, oh, yeah. before you ask, when you sit down with him, I would love to know. I would love to have him dish about his time working on oil derricks. Yeah. He used to work on the Ancestors to the Deepwater Horizon, um, you know, helicopter fly out, you know, six months on board. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never quite gotten those stories out of him. <laughs> and I would, I, I would, I would appreciate hearing about that. Sorry. I didn't mean to uh, do that. No, no, I'm, I'm cool. What do you want to know? Well, his question, uh, which I'm hoping is not something you're going to punch me over. I won't. Um, is it possible for a coward to write effectively about heroes? That is a great story. Um, a great question. Um, yeah, I would say yes, because the reality is that I wasn't uh, sure if he was implying that you're a coward, which is what I was afraid you were going to punch me over. But no, go on, yeah. and I would never punch <laughs> you or, or anybody else. Um, I um, um, I really think that the truth of it is is that there are no cowards and there are no heroes. Um, I have never, you know, I, like I said, I grew up without a rock under me, hmm. and I never got past that. Um, and I'm not exaggerating or playing for sympathy when I say that I am scared every moment of my life from when I wake up, from the second I wake up, from the second I go to bed. I'm scared all the time. Um, and people would say, well, that's, that's no problem. It just matters that you make brave choices, that you face that fear and move forward anyway. But that idea that people are monolithic is just not true. Um, 
Sometimes I make brave choices and move forward. And sometimes I let fear rule me and um, move back you know, uh, uh, don't make good choices. Um, it's funny. I was texting back and forth with a friend of mine who's a, a SEAL, um, a Navy SEAL, was a Navy SEAL, and he's now um, a professional sky jumper. Like he, he set the world record for um, flying, distance flying in a wingsuit. He's on like Team Red Bull. And so like he basically makes his living doing death-defying stunts every day. I bungee jump once, but that was it. <laughs> he's an ama- amazing guy. Uh, his name's Andy Stumpf. You should uh, uh, Google him. He's He's one of the most amazing people I've ever met. And we were talking and I was like, you know, I'd really wish I could be a full-time writer. I, I, I want to be a full-time writer. And he goes, just quit your job, dude. You'll crush it. And I was like, I can't do that, man. Like, you know, I, I, I tried that and, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, and the reality of what it, what it, when I drilled down into it was that like, I'm just scared to take that risk. Mm-hmm. And here's a guy and look, Andy's a really smart guy, an excellent writer. People should read his blog. It's Confessions of an Idiot. Um, I'm trying to get him to change the title. Uh, no, it's he's not, pretty good. He's not an idiot. Yeah, he's not it, confessing it, anything. But it's pretty good. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. That's um, a problem. He, um, he is like, he, when you'll see when you read his writing, he's not stupid enough to say that he doesn't feel fear. And he feels fear all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, he just has found a way to routinize his coping mechanism so that he faces it every time. And makes the forge ahead call every time. And it is the thing I think above all others that I admire about him. Um, I'm not there yet. I try. I try so hard. And there, and I've taken some breathtaking risks. All three trips to Iraq for me were volunteer. I raise my hand each time. Going into Deepwater Horizon, I beg them to activate me. Up to my armpits in oil. You know, who knows what? Weird friggin' diseases I got from that. I mean, there's Louisiana in general, so you know. <laughs> my my in laws are down there, so you know. That's, um, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't love it. Um, yeah. And then uh, um, qu- I quit an incredibly high paying job for life, uh, and came up here and was a broke writer. I'm very lucky that I didn't wind up having to be poor for the rest of my life, and that I was able to get a job. So I'm certainly no stranger to taking risks, but to do it consistently the way he does, um, I I'm not there yet. I'm really not there yet. When you describe the the sensation of being afraid every moment, it sounds like it predates your Iraq. It does. World. It does. Iraq um, exacerbated it beyond belief. That's what I wonder. How the PTSD, which you've written about, yeah. um, how it looks from the inside versus who you were before then. So here's the thing about, and this is, look, I'm not a medical professional, so please, you know, don't take my word on it. All I can tell you is what I think, and this is what I said in the essay. And that essay was incredibly popular. I, if my books were as popular as that essay, I'd, I'd uh, be New York Times bestseller. Um, You'd people, be sitting with some schlub from New Jersey and a couple of microphones, but that's mind. okay. That's, I don't that's, mind. That's, uh, <laughs> you've certainly interviewed uh, far more famous people than me on this show. Um, so here's the thing, is that people talk about PTSD like it's a snap event. Something happens and something inside you breaks. And then from then after, you are ill. You have an illness. Mm -hmm. And this illness manifests itself with flashbacks or numbness or or whatever it is. And I'm not saying that that is not a valid interpretation. But it's never the PTSD I experienced. And it's never the PTSD anybody I talked to experienced. For us, it was more like this thing where one day you wake up and you realize that this slow, gradual change has been happening to you over years and for me, it was less about numbness and um, uh, no, flashback flashbacks. And, and, no, you know, for me, it was about trauma. boredom and about a change in goals, an inability to find significance in the kinds of things I had before. I, f- I felt like the drama of being in intelligence and being in war and knowing that the decisions I made took people's lives, saved people's lives, changed people's lives. Um, and then having to come back and sit in an air conditioned office. Yeah, that's, that's a subject that's come up. We had, um, one of my, my past guests, she's a, a literature teacher at West Point and they were sending off cadets around 2000, in the early 2000s who were going over there commanding and coming out at like 28, 29 years old right. and, and okay, you're back in America now, go find a, a right. meeting to your life. I'll never and, forget you know, Yep. She said, invariably, they, they end up just getting a motorcycle and zooming 200 miles an hour across the horizon and doing something other than, you know, a job. 
because they just can't I, cope with the lack of stimulus. Well, I don't know. Again, I, I'm you know. No, I and I totally get it. Yeah, um, yeah it was the boredom. Um, and I'll never forget. I, I got back and um, I didn't have any clothes because all I had was this like five eleven tactical gear and, and crap that I was wearing while I was over there, and half of it was full of camel spider eggs anyway. So I just got rid of it because you yeah. know, look, I don't want to be that douchebag who wears. The five eleven tactical pants to the mall. Like there's too yeah. many guys like that. That's that's like holster kisser, holster kisser central. I don't <laughs> want to be that dude. Yeah. So I got rid of all that, um, and I didn't have any clothes. So I went to Universal Gear, which is this like um, very hip, you know, store in Dupont Circle, which is the gay neighborhood in in DC. And this like fabulous attendant who is there, and I walk in there, and you know, he was kind of like. Can I help you? Like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, look, man, I just got back from Iraq. <laughs> I don't know how to dress. I don't know what to buy. Here's how much money I have. Will you please pick out my clothes for me? And he was like thrilled. And he put me in a dressing room. And it was a couple of things. It was like the first kindness anybody had shown me in a long time. Um, it's kind of rough over there. And um, And he obsessed over matching colors and the fit and how things hung on me. And I kept thinking like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> how does this matter? This like, isn't functional if I'm bursting through a door and yeah. Well, yeah. I don't yeah. well, uh, you know, yeah. like he, it clearly mattered to him and having yeah. to see that was my first experience of like, who are you? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't have anything to do with you. And then of course my friends took me out to dinner and I'll, and I, I went to this place which had butter pairing. Like you, they, you would pick the kind of bread and the kind of butter that went with it. And I'm thinking yeah. like, I, and, and it was this sense of like, it was the first time I'd ever felt totally isolated while socializing. Mm -hmm. Like I had nothing to do with these people. And, um, and the fear plays into that because when you're scared all the time, you are separate from almost anybody who isn't. You know, and I used to get mad at people who were laughing and letting their guard down or I'd walk along the street and I'd see a bag, an unattended bag. I still do this. And I'd like kind of like kick it around and look in it. And my friends would be like, what are you doing? And I would get so fucking mad, you know, that they would dare to, yeah. you know, you know what I'm doing? I'm looking for a goddamn bomb. What the fuck are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, you're not doing anything. And, uh... That still happens, honestly. Like, um, you know, people get frustrated, got somewhere to go, and I'm wasting time looking in a bag that's clearly a bag of trash that some bum left there. Yeah. But I can't not check. Yeah. Um, because the I feel like the one time I don't is when there's going to be something in there. And um, the way I cope with it, the first, like, the big major step for me when I wrote in that essay was realizing that this is not a thing that gets fixed. This is not a pathology. This isn't something you treat. It isn't something you even change. I'm different now than I was before those experiences. And that's okay. And the trick for me has been to change my goals. That I'm a different person who has to live a different way and want different things. It's not enough for me to buy a house, and get married, have kids and settle down and make money and all of the things that like I thought before were what you do. I have to do different things and want different things. And once I accepted that, it made it a lot easier. I still have a tough time sometimes, but like I have it way better, I think, than a lot of people. Um, that was super helpful to me. And apparently from the reactions to the article, that was super helpful to a lot of other people. Could you have written the way you write no previously? Way. No way. No way. I Look, I would not... 9-11... It's funny. I was just asked to speak uh, to a Veterans Day um, event uh, for the city of New York um, about 9-11. And one of the things I said is that 9-11 is a horrible tragedy. And if I could go back in time, I would undo it. And at the same time, I'm incredibly grateful that it happened because it set off a chain of events that changed me in ways... I am incredibly grateful before. I love myself so much more than I did before I had the chance to go fight. And it's busted me up in a lot of ways and knocked me around in a lot of ways and I'm paid for it in a lot of ways. 
and I just like myself better now. I'm a better person. Um, I'm more ethical now. I'm more conscientious. You know, I would have just gone with the flow. Um, and the prevailing culture in the military is a certain way. I just would have gone along with it. I never would have been the kind of person who could look in the mirror and say, no, this is wrong. And I'm, you know, I'm going to take whatever lumps I have to to stand up to it. Um, I'm immensely, immensely grateful for Iraq. And at the same time, I'm immensely, immensely horrified by Iraq. Um, it's a weird, conflicted feeling, but uh, it's where I'm at. Was there a, holy shit, why are we here during your time there? Or was it afterwards when you got back to the States? So there were two things. One was a gradual thing. Because I went over there to fight al-Qaeda, and the va- who, as you know, are Sunni extremists. And the vast majority of the fire I took was from Jaish al-Mehdi, which are the followers of Muqtad al-Sadr. They're not al-Qaeda. They're the polar opposite of al-Qaeda. They're Shia. Mm-hmm. Al-Qaeda, I think of them as, you know, kafar. And um, well, for those of you listeners that don't speak Arabic, kafar means uh, an unbeliever, an infidel. Um, so I began to understand the complication of the... Uh, I forgot where we were. Oh, uh, your life being torn asunder and coming out better and stronger. You know, yeah, six million I, dollar manish. Well, stuff. yeah, I guess right. <laughs> That's I'm saying. Yeah, I guess it, it sounds. Look, it sounds dramatic. Um, there are definitely times when I when I take stock of my own um, uh, life. You know, it's funny when I, you know, I'm I'm amazed sometimes myself with like where I come from and what I did. Um, but I think that. What is it? Woody Allen has said that ninety nine percent of life is showing up. Yeah, like you know, you just kind of flail ahead and and. I had career by attrition. That's been my, uh, my my way of doing it until my last couple of years, where I actually went out and did something. Usually, people just quit or died ahead of me, under suspicious circumstances. But still, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, like I, I mean, I look, I went into IT because I wanted to make money. I got the clearance because they needed people in IT, mm-hmm. and then once I had the clearance, I was like, well, heck. You know, I'm not married. I don't have kids. I could take a pay cut. I'll move into ops. Right. And so it really was a, a fumbling. Snowden? Snowden is complicated. So for me, Snowden is a tragedy. Um, and in a tragedy, everybody loses. And I, um, I include Manning in this. So Edward Snowden did mishandle and reveal classified information. And that is absolutely unconscionable um, and unacceptable. And in so doing, he revealed real wrongdoing on the part of the government, which is noble and wonderful. And um, I wouldn't walk that back either. And because of him, we have a cleaner, more honest NSA. Um, But he did. So, A, the government looks worse. He set back our intelligence communities programs by many years and many millions of dollars, and people may have been killed. Um, He tarnished the government's reputation, and he ruined his own life, mind you. (laughs) Edward Snowden does not have a good life. Um, A hotel in Moscow is Yeah, it's great for him, I'm sure. (laughs) Um, And so, so everybody lost. America lost. Snowden lost. Our intelligence community lost. Everybody lost. So I just sort of feel a deep and profound sense of sadness, a deep and profound sense of sadness that the conditions existed for a Snowden, that um, there was such systemic wrongdoing that a Snowden had something to talk about, and also that our security, that our CI, our counterintelligence apparatus allowed a Snowden to occur. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just sad all around. Mm -hmm. Your keys to crisis preparedness? That's the last one I'll ask you. But, you know, you, you did once mention in a post basically having, you know, a few hours to, to get down to Louisiana. Yeah, to yeah, that was my, um So the, 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 it's wonderful. They teach you this when you're a reservist. Um, when you're a reservist, it's all about planning. When you're a reservist, you have to be ready to deploy. You have 24 hours from the time the, the, the trumpet sounds. And mismovement is big trouble. You don't want to do that. So what you do is you have your sea bag packed by your door, ready to go at all times, and you have a plan for how, who's going to take care of your cat, who's going to, who has power of attorney over your, if you get hurt, who's going to pay your electric bill, what's your landlord going to think, blah, blah, blah. So the key to crisis preparedness is to have a plan, and that plan should cover every minutia of your life. So at any given moment, aliens could descend from the sky and lift me into the firmament, and um, 
my my the business of my life, my literary estate, my apartment, my mm. friends and family, all of that would run on smoothly and without incident as if I had never left because the plan is in place. Mm. And you've managed to uh, keep that vibe? Uh, it gets harder and harder every day I'm out of the reserve, yeah. but, um, just in terms of life getting more complicated or not having that pressure to, it's, I have keep to keep the, the pressure on myself. Look, yeah. I, 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 uh, God, it's, it's such a ridiculous thing to say. I take a tremendous amount of pride in being a difficult person to kill. And I, <laughs> I, uh, I strive really hard to continue to maintain that. Last question comes from Neil. Honor or loyalty? What's more important in the military? Man, that's a tough one. Um, I would have said loyalty, um, but I've come to see it as honor. Um, you know, it's funny. Hacksaw Ridge uh, is a movie that's just hitting theaters. And for those of you who don't know, it's about a, uh, a pacifist, a conscientious objector who won the Medal of Honor. Um, and that man's loyalty was called into question left, right, and center. Um, he wouldn't do what people wanted him to do. Um, and he stuck to his principles. And in the end, um, it really saw him through. And uh, uh, a lot of our greatest military thinkers, I forget the guy who invented the Air Force, the guy who came up with the Army Air Corps that became the Air Force, was run out of town on a rail for that position. And look how much that benefited us. One of the foremost thinkers, um, Genghis John Boyd, we call him, uh, who came up with this idea of the Oodoo Loop. I won't bother describing it, but it's one of the great innovations and in thinking about counterterrorism was reviled for his um, positions. Um, and I really do think that if your principles are in the right place, um, there's the famous speech that Captain America gives to Spider-Man. You know, you stand by the river of truth and when everyone is telling you to move, you plant your feet like the roots of a tree and you say, no, you move. Mm -hmm. And um, that to me is the soul of honor. Mike Cole, thanks so much for coming on the Virtual Memory Show. Thanks for having me. And that was Mike Cole. His website is mikecole.com, but the secret, which I did not tell you from the very beginning, is that Mike is spelled with a Y. So it's M-Y-K-E-C-O-L-E.com. Like I said, I enjoyed the crap out of his first two Shadow Ops books, and I'll probably read the third one in a couple of weeks once the upcoming guest-related reading lightens. Um, but if you enjoyed this episode, pick up his books, get rolling. Uh, Control Point is the first Shadow Ops novel. It's, um, it's a lot of fun. Now, after the main conversation, I asked Mike, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear his answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or at paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show, including that podcast, a patron-only blog. I'm getting ready to put together a series of e-books that I'm going to start rolling out next year, and those are only going to be available to our supporters, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. This one was recorded in New York City, so expenses included the toll at the George Washington Bridge, uh, parking on West 96th at my favorite garage, where this time I bumped into the guy who played Taub on the show House. If any of you are fans of that, he was the plastic surgeon who becomes part of House's second uh, consultation team. Um, the irony was that I had a few days of stubble going on, and I kind of look like Hugh Laurie when I do that, so uh, we both gave each other weirdly knowing glances when we cross paths in the garage and did look him up on on twitter and dropped a line about it and he was in fact that guy so i'm not making this up um but anyway besides that there was a subway to and from union square um and a coffee so in total uh just the getting to and from this episode cost about 50 bucks uh if you want to help defray some of those ongoing costs uh like travel web hosting equipment and more uh then visit patreon dot com slash vms pod or paypal dot me slash vms pod and make a one time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Paul W. Jones, 
Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, Craig P. Steffen, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David's got a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David, and you can find out more and support that at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual memory Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with, I hope, uh, Drew Friedman, who will be his third appearance on the show. He's got a new book out, and there's a documentary that someone's trying to put together about him. So um, we're supposed to get together next weekend and record, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping, since that other episode fell through that I mentioned early in this episode, um, that Drew will be our next guest. Until next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or the more inclusive chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Uh, on Instagram, I, I just put up funny pictures and make dumb jokes, but it's kind of worth following. Occasionally, there's one that's podcast related, but really, it's just me making dumb jokes with a, a good picture. Uh, we're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtual memories show and at virtual memories podcast dot tumblr dot com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the virtual memories show and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. Mm-hmm.